For the forces fighting the war in Ukraine, understanding the lessons of that conflict and keeping up with the constant adaptation in tactics is absolutely essential. As in almost any war, it's not just equipment, but training and execution that drives combat effectiveness. And on both sides, the fighting to date has constantly challenged the understandings and tactics that are in place in February 2022. But it's not just Russian and Ukrainian forces that are finding their experience and understanding challenged. As well as providing equipment, many NATO forces have been asked to step up and provide training to Ukrainian personnel. That has often meant trying to train Ukrainians to fight a war that looks very different from most Western military deployments since the end of the Cold War. Russian tank brigades have a lot more firepower than the Taliban, and it might be hard to train Ukrainians to fight by the book, when the playbook in question often calls for waiting for the US Air Force to come in and remove the opposing force from existence. The challenge then for NATO and other allied militaries is probably twofold. Firstly, in a world where preparing for LISCO, large-scale combat operations, is back at the top of the priority list, how can NATO and other allied militaries capture the right lessons from the war in Ukraine without having their forces engaged in it? And how can they best go about providing vital training to Ukrainian personnel in a way that provides the quantity and capability the Ukrainians require without having first-hand experience of the battlefield they're preparing them to fight on? It's a factor which may impact how the war plays out in 2024, but at the same time, understanding what it takes to learn lessons and train a force at that scale is a specialised skill. And so today, I'll be welcoming back retired US Army Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, someone who was deeply involved in training Ukrainian forces during his time as the commander of the US Army in Europe. Over the course of a recent interview, I asked him questions focused on a couple of key points. Firstly, what lessons NATO and Allied forces might be taking from the fighting in Ukraine, and what challenges they might be facing gathering those lessons and adapting based on them. Then I want to walk through NATO's efforts in providing training support to the Ukrainian military starting with the efforts pre-February 2022 and going up to the most recently announced programs. There, I want to cover what's been involved in those efforts, what sort of scale they're operating on, and whether they can actually effectively deliver on what Ukraine needs in the here and now. Finally, I'll ask the General for his evaluation of the performance of the Ukrainian military over 2023 and get a sense of what he expects to change over the course of 2024. Note that to keep the presentation cohesive, the ordering of some segments has been changed, but nothing material from the original interview has been omitted. But before we jump into it, I need to offer a quick word from a sponsor. Whether you're talking about Ukraine, the Middle East, or global events in general, in any given week there might be a daunting amount of news for people to follow, and far more than I can fit in a single one-hour video. That's one reason I've been a long-term fan of Ground News. Ground News is a combination website and app that tries to give readers a more objective and data-driven way to consume news. They provide updates on hundreds of stories a day with quick visual breakdowns, flagging elements like media ownership. If you look, for example, at this story about Russia approving a record defence budget, you'll see which sources cover the topic and find potentially relevant context like ownership information. Ground News also makes it relatively easy to compare headlines. And if you decide to take advantage of their new comparison feature, then with one click you can identify recurring differences between reporting at different ends of the political spectrum. That tool might be a useful first step to identify potential trends across dozens of different headlines. Ground News also now has something called the Blind Spot Feed, which specifically seeks to highlight stories that might be receiving disproportionate coverage from different parts of the political spectrum. So if you are interested, there'll be a link in the description that'll give you access to a 40% discount on a Ground News Vantage subscription. Among other things, that'll give you access to the My News Bias feature, which allows you to dashboard and analyse your news consumption. So to start with one of the big questions up front, and that is essentially, how well do NATO and other allied forces understand the battlefield in Ukraine? And to what extent do their training programs and the skills those programs seek to impart match with some of the lessons to come out of the war so far? Let's cut straight to a point in the interview where we were discussing those questions. Um, obviously, this is very anecdotal, but when we look at the feedback for Ukrainians that have gone through some of the training programs that have been run for them since February before deploying back to their units, we do sometimes see questions over whether the training that NATO nations have put them through really aligns with or matches the, ex the battlefield experience that they're going to go into. Yeah. Some observations are things like um, assumptions around the density of enemy fires and minefields, or I think the big one that constantly comes up is whether you're allowed to use your drones during training and account for that omnipresence of a treatable ISR absolutely everywhere on the battlefield. I guess my question to you is, in terms of getting that content right, firstly, what are some of the key features of the Ukrainian battlefield, especially at that tactical level, that have stood out to you as maybe necessitating different tactics and skills than NATO forces might have been training for before this? I have to say, I, I think that w there's been a degree of uh, 
arrogance, innocent arrogance, but nonetheless arrogance that assumed, okay, we're going to teach the Ukrainians how to fight. When in fact, they've got tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers that have been fighting for years. Um, and we, the West, the collective West, really have almost zero experience with operations um, at this scale. Now, after 2014, we began to change back to doing that sort of thing. But of course, between the end of the Cold War and 2014, um, most of what we had been doing was Iraq and Afghanistan, counterterrorism, et cetera. Uh, and even in Iraq, the only large scale operations we really did were, were, were within that first year. I'm, I'm generalizing a little bit, but that's uh, in Afghanistan with a couple of exceptions. It was mostly, you know, small unit stuff, um, counterterrorism, going after Taliban, et cetera. So our own experience in operating um, in with minefields that were that dense, we had no experience, no nope, zero. Um, we uh, um, ha have not operated in an environment with drones like that. In fact, I was so impressed with what I was learning from the Ukrainians at Yavariv. We changed our training model at Hohenfels. We gave the Op 4 at Hohenfels, Germany, uh, the same sort of uh, electronic warfare capability and drones and uh, massed artillery and rocket fire uh, that the Russians had as of 2015 and 16. And uh, oh boy, that changed that changed the environment at Hohenfels. And so when our units would go through the training, they would get crushed for the first 10 days until they figured out how to operate in that environment. And, and General Milley was chief of the army at the time. He saw that, and then he changed the whole U.S. Army training model based on what we were learning from Ukrainians. And I think that um, General Zeluzhny's frustration with us after criticisms of the uh, ground component of the counteroffensive this summer is a little bit like, you guys don't understand the, the environment here, uh, you guys being the West. And, and I think he's right. You know, We would never send an American soldier or a British soldier or any Allied soldier into that environment until we had already achieved uh, overwhelming air superiority and had, you know, miles and miles of uh, breaching equipment. And yet, you know, people are standing back pointing the finger at the Ukrainians for not doing what we taught them, it's, that's uh, absolute bullshit. The comment you've made about the army having spent years learning how to do the counterinsurgency role, the Afghanistan, the Iraq missions, to an extent that uh, does mesh, at least anecdotally, with some of the feedback I've seen from some Ukrainians who make comments like uh, being taught to do a whole bunch of urban warfare training in a war that's largely fought tree line to tree line in very open terrain by contrast. Um, yeah. or that still relies on scouts being trained to primarily do in-person reconnaissance when a lot of the reconnaissance work in Ukraine is now done by the drones. I think I have yeah. a two-part question here, which is, are there any other major developments that stand out to you that need to be taught at that tactical level? And secondly, how do you get instructors to teach useful skills that relate to a battlefield that they have never fought on and have no direct uh, institutional memory of? Well, I think. Um so to the second part first, it needs to be Ukrainians that are the teachers and instructors. Um, you know, they're the ones with the actual experience that can stand in front of a group of uh, junior officers, uh, new officers or uh, troops and help explain, all right, this is, you know, when you see this, this, this is what's coming. And uh, this is how you counter, you know, the different, whether it's Russian drones or artillery or uh, these uh, massed uh, attacks that uh, that they're dealing with now. And this is how you properly dig a trench with overhead cover so you have a chance to survive and then still be able to fight. That's not going to come from an American or a German or a Brit. That's going to come from a Ukrainian. So I think what we can be doing is help provide the infrastructure, uh, take some of the burden of infrastructure off of them, you know, running the facilities, helping augment and that sort of thing. But the the, the key principal instructor should be a Ukrainian speaking to them in their own language based on his or her experience. So that's, I, I think that's got to be a key part. Now, obviously, if we're talking about training people how to use a Patriot or flying F-16s or uh, using 
specific equipment that we provide, obviously, um, that's that's appropriate for us to be doing. But I think there's enough Ukrainians now that are experienced, and frankly, some of them may have physical disabilities. They may have lost a leg or an arm, but they they still have uh, brain and experience, and and they can be part of cadre to help train. That's that that would be my sense. Now, the first part of your question, I think, was about specific type tasks that's maybe not being trained enough. Uh, I was on the phone the other night with a dear friend of mine. He's a Ukrainian officer who I've known since well, 2005. He was part of the Ukrainian element that was in Iraq with us, and we just stayed friends. And so he's been in nonstop fighting since uh, 2014. And uh, he's the one that really impressed on me the uh, density and the quality of Russian electronic warfare. He said it's, they've never seen anything like that. Uh, the Russians have always been better than us. I mean, that's always been a part of their organization and way of fighting. Um, and, and they've only continued to get better. At, whereas we, the West, we lost that. After the Cold War, we really lost a lot of that. So um, being able to operate in an environment where um, if you're on a, any communications device that is not um, secure, frequency hopping, for example, uh, those kinds of things, then you're going to get jammed, uh, you're going to be found, targeted, and you're going to get hit. So uh, having to practice in that kind of environment, um, it's not just a technical solution. It's also about discipline, how to communicate not getting on the radio and just talking on and on and on, which is, by the way, is what we used to practice when I was a lieutenant 100 years ago back in the uh, 80s in Germany. You know, uh, before we had all these secure radios, you really had to practice discipline. And I, I think that's part of what um, he's he's talking about. And then the uh, exactly as General Jaluzhny pointed out in this famous uh, Economist uh, article, um, the, the fact that there are Russian drones everywhere. And they can not only see, but they also have uh, thermal, uh, can can detect heat. And, and so you've got to uh, continue to find ways to not only uh, manage your signature concealment, but also more and more means to uh, uh, protect or counter those things. I was looking at a video yesterday of uh, where the Russians are erecting um, screens over their trench lines. Um, that prevent these FPVs, these little individual drones, from being able to fly inside the trench uh, and and get uh, Russian soldiers. So interesting, it you know it'll be things like that uh, as as both sides continue to try to figure out how do they protect against the uh, the drones that are out there. I think there's one last follow up question I want to ask here before we move on to that lessons learned zone, and that is as you've just flagged. This is a conflict where we've seen a lot of tactical adaptation, counter-adaptation, really quick change in what the fighting often looks like. At the start of the war, the Russians were barely using things like FPVs. Now we're at the point where we're seeing individual jammers mounted on individual vehicles and tens of thousands of small drones used constantly. So if you're from a training curriculum perspective, how do you make sure that you're not training troops for the battle, not just not just the last war, but even the battle six months ago that might look very different to what it looks like now? Well, I think that's why um, uh, you make a good point, by the way. You, you know, no army, including the U.S. Army, has the ability to have so much, so many resources tied up in training because they're needed in, in combat. So to try and practice the scale of drones uh when you don't, you may not have them available for training. So being able to replicate things, replicating ammunition, replicating things for your logistics training, for example, uh, is an important part of it. And we invest a lot of money ourselves um, at, at our training centers. This is why the the focus of of training uh, needs to be on uh, how to think on, on dealing with conditions of uncertainty, so that officers and sergeants and soldiers are accustomed to uh, adaptation, that they're expected to be innovative, that they're expected to look for solutions. So that, that's what gets rewarded. Um, not how, how well can you memorize um, how to install something, but how quickly are you able to adapt? And so training has to provide as many opportunities as possible for leaders at every level to make decisions. 
without perfect information because that's the nature of war. And so training has got to replicate that uh, nature, that friction, that uh, uncertainty, that fog that we all grew up studying. Um, the training has got to replicate that. So it's it's in the mindset that you are expected. I mean, uh, uh, where leaders know that they are expected to be prepared to make decisions without adequate resources and without perfect information, yet they st- you still have to be successful. And so that creates a sort of a culture and mindset of uh, innovation and adaptation. That Those are the kind of virtues that uh, the leadership uh, has to extol uh, in, in everything that should be pervasive. And um, I, I think Ukrainians do that. They, by nature, seem to be more creative and adaptive than uh, – Anybody I've ever seen, soldiers of any army, I, it's incredible. And, and Jean Jaluzhny has made that a point of effort uh, since becoming the chief of the uh, of the defense. So then the question then is, let's switch around perhaps to the other side of this information flow. We focused on NATO training Ukraine. Now I'd like to ask the question about the information flowing in the other way, which is the lessons being captioned and being reflected. It's been interesting to see, for example, that after observing the the cages, the anti-drone cages that are put around armored vehicles in Ukraine, we've now seen, for example, Israeli Merkavas mounting the same thing during their operations in Gaza. From a historical perspective, a lot of the times armies have gathered lessons by deploying observers and actually seeing what is happening. Um, I remember the famous story of Royal Navy observers going to the Russo-Japanese War, for example, and that changing their view of how what naval combat was going to look like. Here, NATO doesn't have a large number of observers as far as we've been told, deployed actually observing um, the fighting in Ukraine. Yeah. So, one, how do you capture those sort of lessons where they're relevant as a force without having observers present? And then uh, the second part, which you can probably deal with separately, is from your perspective on the outside looking in, what are some of the lessons that we might have taken from the battlefield so far? Well, this is um, this is an excellent question. I, part of this is... Um, making sure that you have a a mental culture of wanting to learn. I always thought the best organizations were learning organizations that were constantly uh, conducting AARs, after action reviews, after everything, and constantly trying to make sure that they had the, um, uh, had the right solutions to what they were um, might have to face. And um, I was, I have to tell you, I was very frustrated back around 2000, 15, 16, as we were spending more and more time with Ukrainians, I kept inviting uh, the artillery school at Fort Silicoma in that period. I said, please, please come forward, send, send a team out here. This is a place where you can watch live counterfire. I mean, we had not been doing counterfire for decades. Here's an opportunity to, to learn and practice and observe how the Ukrainians are using our counterfire radar and conducting counterfire missions. And uh, I, I was not effective at persuading my own army to, to bring forward a large uh, element that would not embed, but at least you know come out and observe exactly what you described earlier. And, and I think we may have lost some time doing that. Now, of course, it's a different situation where there is a limitation on the number of U.S. Uh, personnel that could be on the ground in Ukraine. I, the other nations probably have something similar. Uh, and it's understandable um, for the strategic and political reasons um, so that you don't have Americans or British or German or Polish personnel killed uh, by Russian rockets. That's, that's understandable. But we've got to figure out a way to to be able to learn and I think the recent announcement or the article that came out about General Aguto here, who is the commander of the uh, Security Advisory Group Ukraine, SAGU, uh, here in Wiesbaden, he's going to be spending uh, a lot of time forward in Ukraine, which I think is makes a lot of sense. And, and so this is not only to uh, understand requirements, but also to make sure that we are learning from what's from what's happening, uh, so that we're we're not, so that we're not lagging behind on our on our own capabilities. From your observations and conversations, without going into anything sensitive, obviously, 
Do you think there are any significant lessons at the operational strategic level that we should be taking and factoring into our planning now? Yeah, absolutely. The, the one that's most talked about, of course, is the is logistics, uh, the consumption rate of artillery and rockets and uh, air defense systems. Um, you know, that's, that's been a, uh, it's much talked about. And certainly in the U.S., I think we have quadrupled our artillery ammunition production, for example, but that's still a, a fraction of, of what would be needed um, for us if we were in this conflict. So, and then, of course, the Israelis are, are, are um, receiving some of that as well. So um, the logistics requirements um, is much, much more than we had thought about two years ago. That That's number one. Number two, um, the uh, recognition of, of drones as a uh, factor on the battlefield. Um, that how, how do you counter that? We were... I can remember we were starting to work on counter UAV techniques uh, back in that 2015, 16, 17 time frame. The Army was working on different things, kinetic and non-kinetic, but it was not, I don't think we envisioned the scale that's required now. So um, I'm pretty sure there's really smart people that are working on uh, electronic means that can uh, jam or disable these thousands of drones that are out there, but it's it's going to take that kind of uh, effort. I think the uh, the electronic warfare that we've talked about, again, this is a skill that we absolutely lost. In Iraq in 2005 and six, uh, the Army, we didn't have EW guys anymore. We It was just something that we had uh, thought we, we don't need anymore because you know, it was the end of the Cold War. And so the U.S. Navy had to provide Remember, Admiral Mullen was the CNO at the time before he became chairman, and uh, he he sent dozens of naval uh, electronic warfare officers to us in Iraq because we needed them to help us figure out how to use all these uh, IED jamming devices we were receiving, but we were jamming our own radios as well because we didn't have the expertise. Uh, so this is, this is a, a skill set that we have got to uh, develop not only to operate in that environment, but to be able to jam uh, Russian communications or whoever we might be fighting at the same sort of distance. Uh, to be fair, I think there's some reporting that suggests the Russians are pretty good at fratricidal jamming as well. So it may not be a uniquely uh, Western force problem, but it's a, it's a solid observation to make. I have one quick addendum I'll add here before we get on to discussing the way forward. So the performance this year and, and next year. And that is, there's been some reporting that's come out that there's been assistance uh, by the West to Ukraine with wargaming and consideration during the planning process. Um, my understanding is when you are wargaming and planning, there's a model that sit be sits behind that to understand what will happen if a certain action is taken. Um, might there be a need to revise some of those models if, to take into account the way uh, fires are now being directed by drones and the different dynamics of the battlefield? Might it be that the some of the assumptions of those planning models might need updating as well as the tactics that are being taught at training fields? Yeah, well, I think that's, you, you put your finger on the key thing. What, what are the assumptions that are being used in wargaming? Um, I think uh, I had read recently that there were some like eight different war games that were conducted before the start of the counteroffensive, uh, the ground portion of it. And if if none of those were, I, I don't know because they were classified, obviously, but, um, you know, we did eight war games and people are surprised that it didn't turn out very well. I mean, I, that either that says something about execution or more likely it says something about our war gaming. We we use wrong assumptions or or is, I, I don't know. I don't want to I don't want to be too critical here because these are things I don't know. I, I was not present. They're classified. Um and that does not speak poorly of the importance of doing war gaming, but making sure that your assumptions are correct and that you don't uh rule out possibilities just because they, they don't fit because of a particular bias. And um I think you know, uh, one of the biggest criticisms of, of Ukraine has been, you know, that they never massed in one place, that instead they were dispersed. Well, wait a minute. Of course, of course, the Ukrainians had to be worried because this is their people 
that are in these areas, and uh, and they were, of course, they were worried about Russians killing and uh, murdering innocent Ukrainian people. So they couldn't just ignore, you know, two thirds of the uh, line of contact because this is their people. This this is different from when you're out in the desert where you can, you know, be more. It's probably a little bit simpler than whether or not to mass or have three or four different axes uh, versus when you're defending your own country. And and so I don't know. Um, you know, how was that taken into account in the different, in the various uh, war gaming? And besides, if you mass everybody in one big giant blue arrow and you still don't have air superiority, then you just have more tanks and Bradleys and martyrs, you know, jamming into that, into that minefield getting hit by artillery. Having covered some of those initial observations, I wanted to turn the discussion over to training itself. From the years of NATO-Ukraine training that took place before February 2022, through to the much larger efforts that we're now seeing. So I thought we'd jump straight into, before talking about the Ukrainian army situation in 2023, I want to go to the story before the full-scale invasion in February 2022. I've heard the Ukrainian military of 2014 through 2022 described as an essentially Soviet-style force that was in the midst of a transition, and NATO was part of that transition story before the Russian invasion. I'm thinking specifically of activities like uh, the joint multinational training group in Ukraine that was operating near Lviv. Obviously, I think that's now moved to Grafenwehr. During your time in Europe, you were involved in that training process. So I thought I'd start by asking the question, what observations could you make about the Ukrainian army of that era and how was it evolving during that time? Well, your your initial description is exactly right. It was a Soviet uh, model that was in the process of evolving. Um, you know, we had Ukrainian troops with that were with us in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they had been on uh, other missions um, that where they were working with Western militaries, not just NATO, but Western militaries. And uh, it was a, a long process because to change to change an army's culture, you have to, you know, the uh, the leadership has to go through the that mental process also the psychological process and 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 so um starting in 2014 um or shortly thereafter uh, we started working with ukrainian troops there in yavariv which was the old soviet and then ukrainian training area near lviv in, in western uh, ukraine and uh you could see that there were um people that were still focused on rote memorization very, very simple tasks. Um, but then you could also see that there were young officers who were veterans of the fighting in 2014 and 15. And I was impressed, particularly with the younger officers, how eager they were to learn and how quickly they learned. In fact, uh, I remember uh, hearing from my my NCOs that were working with them, they were like, "Sir, these guys are really good." They and we began to learn from them. So, and obviously that probably played into the performance that we saw in the early stages of 2022. But also, the training mission obviously at that point had to evolve considerably because scale became much more important when you're talking about a mobilized army. Um, the observation I'd make post 2022 is that NATO's training efforts can sort of be described as splitting into two streams. There's the, the quantity effort of providing basic infantry training to as many new Ukrainian recruits as possible. And then there's been specific training programs on particular systems, the, the Patriot crews, the Bradley crews, the Abrams crews, so that they familiarise with their systems. In terms of numbers, I think the UK says they put about 30,000 Ukrainians through Interflex, which is their multinational effort. I think the numbers we've gotten for all the NATO efforts combined is about 90,000 Ukrainians to this point. I think the question I have to ask you in the context of um, this, a large-scale peer-on-peer conflict, is that for the regular public, it might be hard to understand what constitutes a large training program effort and where the lines of the easy, the possible, and the impossible sit. So I basically want to ask the question, how well does the effort we've seen so far align with what Ukraine needs, and how does it compare with what might practically be possible? Okay, so this is a, a pretty broad, open, uh, ended kind of question. So, so bear with me. Um, you know, part of part of our mission was to help uh, not only help train uh, Ukrainian forces as they were um, 
fighting in what back then was called the ATO, the Anti-Terrorism Operations Zone. This was the this was that part of uh, eastern Ukraine in the Donbass that um, the so-called separatists, who were obviously were Russian proxies, were operating. And after the Russians had seized Crimea, and so uh, in accordance with the Minsk uh, process and the uh, agreements and the ceasefires and all of this, you still had Ukrainian brigades that were deployed out there. And so our job was to help prepare the brigades as they deployed for their rotation uh, to the ATO. Now, the Army had not really grown that much yet. It was it was still in the process of figuring itself out. You also had National Guard, uh, Ukrainian National Guard, which is kind of a quasi-interior uh, force, uh, but looked a whole lot like soldiers. So the Ukrainians, the Minister of Defense and Minister of the Interior were, were still trying to figure out what they were going to do. This was during the time of President Poroshenko. Uh, you had two or three different defense ministers. Um, General Mozhenko uh, was the uh, chief of defense, uh, who a really, really very good officer, um, an old school Soviet style officer. But nonetheless, you, you could see that he understood that they were in transition and that they had to transition. So uh, part of our task was not just helping with training, um, but also to create a training center so that Ukrainians could do this themselves in a in a normal sort of way. So Yavariv, uh, we brought our team from uh, 7th Army Training Command back in Grafenvir, brought them out to Yavariv to help set up the training center um, and, and all that that entails, to include cadre and op, 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 uh, op four, opposing force, et cetera. And I encouraged General Majenko, I said, look, uh, if you want to have a good training center, you got to have quality cadre. So bringing back your best captains and majors and colonels that had the experience from fighting, get them into the uh, cadre there. And if you want them to do that, then you've got to also provide for them and their families. So you got to have housing and, and make it attractive as well as career enhancing to have uh, a tour working at the training center. So those were the kind of things we were trying to do. But and this and this, of course, to be able to to push brigades through, which is what we do at you know the National Training Center in the US or the Joint Readiness Training Center or at our training center in Hohenfels, these are set up for brigade size units. So a brigade is around 5,000 troops. So that was the scale we were working on then whereas individual training was still the responsibility of the Ukrainian army in their own structure. And then we started getting uh, equipment, uh, new equipment provided for uh, Ukrainian armed forces. And, and this was still in the pre-lethal aid uh, era. So not even Javelin were authorized, but we did uh, get the uh, Q-36 uh, counterfire radar. So Yavariv be, be, uh, became the place, the training center became the place where you could also in, help integrate new equipment. And that's that's when I really began to realize uh, how fast uh, Ukrainians could learn new technology, new equipment. And we quickly discovered that that radar was better than we even knew it. I'd, I've personally never been under Russian artillery or rocket fire. Uh, these guys live under it. And so they became very proficient. So I, I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, establishing a, a foundation and institutions for training that allows the rotation of units uh, to come through was an important part of the process. And then I visited two different uh, military academies. There was one in Kharkiv and one there in Lviv. And I was struck by the difference between the two, even though both of them were producing future lieutenants. One of them seemed to be a little bit, the one in Lviv, frankly, seemed to be more um, focused on you know, thinking. It is more, more open, uh, a little bit more Western, if you will. The one in Kharkiv, I, it was like being back in the 1950s. I mean, it was absolute rote, rote memorization, and it was, it was frustrating at the time. They've come a long way since then, obviously, but that's what we were having to help them overcome. I then wanted to move the discussion to some of NATO's efforts to support Ukrainian training after February 2022. Since that point, both Russia and Ukraine have had to contend with training bottlenecks. 
as they struggle to integrate thousands of new volunteers or mobilised personnel into their armed forces. The flagship effort here has probably been the UK's Operation Interflex, where trainers from around 10 countries have trained approximately 30,000 Ukrainian recruits since June 2022. Across all programs and contributors, some estimates of Ukrainians trained trend as high as 90,000. But in the context of a fight where armies have increased in size by hundreds of thousands, I wanted to get Ben Hodge's impression of the scale and sufficiency of the effort. So in terms of the scale of what's being attempted now, where NATO has to an extent taken on trying to add to the training pipeline, trying to provide individual training as well, in the, in the context of a war where we're talking about large mobilised armies, is, does that represent a sufficient effort and how does that compare to what like the total training pipeline of the NATO nations might be? Yeah, that that is a large number, and it's it's more than anybody in Europe is doing for sure. I mean, the the polls are the only ones that would come close in terms of scale. Um, and when I think about the U.S. Army, you know, the how many tens of thousands of new privates uh, that we bring into the army uh, every year, you know, something like ninety thousand is more than what we would be doing. So um, that's that's a significant scale, especially when you go from uh, not from zero, but you have to do a pretty dramatic increase while you're at war. And so the real question is, who's training them? I mean, who 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 are the trainers? And you're talking about different languages. Um, so until you have enough Ukrainian uh, officers and sergeants who have the experience and skill to be the cadre at all the different training centers, then you have to have, uh, then the allies are having to do it. So much like what the UK has done, uh, other allies have done, whether it's um, basic type training or specific training for Patriot or the uh, German uh, Panzerhaubitzer 2000 self-propelled uh, howitzers where the Germans were training Ukrainians at the German uh, artillery school. Uh, at Eder Oberstein, um, you, there's a language piece to it, but we consistently, consistently underestimated how fast um, the Ukrainians could learn things, and and, and uh, um, I think we we could adapt. It took us a little while to adapt our training models to accommodate them, but also the fight to which they were going uh, that they were entering. Well, you've touched on something there that leads very well into another question I wanted to ask. When you mentioned the importance of having Ukrainian officers and Ukrainian NCOs that can augment the training process, this is an issue that I think some observers have made in relation to, I think, both the Russian and Ukrainian armies to an extent now that they are mobilized, much enlarged and fighting. And that is, while you can mobilize enlisted personnel rapidly to bulk out the force, there's a shortage of experienced and capable officers, which often means... Uh, the observation is brigades, for example, not being able to coordinate offensive actions realistically, plan and coordinate them above a platoon or a company level. So I think my question to you is, how different is the training process as opposed to a rifleman who might be doing a five-week course at Interflex to learn how to hold a trench, how different it is to, to train up an officer who can work at, for example, a brigade command level and provide that sort of function to a force that's fighting a war at this scale? Yeah, it's it's a completely different um, process uh, for the uh, when you're preparing officers to serve at the battalion, brigade level, and higher. Uh, you need the combination of schooling. So a typical U.S. Army or British or Australian or German officer would go through courses as a student in the course where you learn about organizations, you learn about the logistics, you learn all the different aspects of command and control um, at that level. And then, of course, you're in collective training where you're in a unit, part of a brigade staff that's going through the exercises where you have to deal with all the friction that's out there when you're trying to uh, move two, 3,000 troops uh, doing 24-7 operations. There's an enemy out there. You're your communications are being jammed or targeted, and uh, you've got real logistics to worry about. I mean, two, 3,000 people that need to eat and drink, and you got to have fuel for vehicles and ammunition and on and on and on. And uh, you, so you have to practice that. And, and it is hard. And when you're trying to coordinate effects of fire and maneuver, uh, engineering, 
And then, uh, and now, in the course in the modern battlefield um, in in Ukraine, with the uh, ubiquitous drones that can see everything, uh, it's a, it's challenging. So you have to practice, and you need uh, you need places like the Yavariv Training Center or back at uh, Grafenvir, Hohenfels, um, or Polish training areas like at uh, Drasko Pomorski, where you can actually practice these things and you get a, a few repetition uh, rotations doing that. And then you're in combat. And the, and the key there is how fast can you disseminate what best practices and, and lessons learned? I, you know, when we went into Iraq in 2003, immediately the brigades within the 101st Airborne Division, I was the commander of the 1st Brigade, we had a very good dissemination of best practices and lessons learned inside the division as we encountered things for the first time. And, and um, my sense is probably that Ukrainians have that, uh, but I, I, I'm not close enough to know it uh, just yet. To give us a sense of scale there, obviously it's a more complicated task establishing those officers with that experience and that understanding before deploying them. The NATO training efforts at the moment are focused on that enlisted basic infantry level. But if, for example, you were given an understrength Ukrainian brigade with legacy equipment and said, hey, I want you to bulk this out to a offensive ready unit with a new set of NATO equipment ready to engage in brigade level offensive operations, in terms of a sense of scale, in terms of time and resources, yeah. what is involved there? Well, of course, um, that's a great scenario. And by the way, this is what I think the Ukrainians are going to be doing over the next uh, few months as they seek to regain the initiative. Um, I think they will they will continue to put pressure on Russian logistics and uh, Russian rear area and that sort of thing. But I think that they're going to be pulling uh, brigades out of the line for to do reconstitution. And this was a common practice in World War II, where units that had been in the line for months would be pulled out for a month or two months, where they could uh, losses could be uh, replaced. Uh, damaged equipment could be repaired or replaced, and they could train on uh, whether it was with new equipment or uh, training the unit uh, based on what the, they were learning from uh, combat. So I would imagine if you had two months, you could, and, and assuming that you've got the core of the unit is intact, and you've got enough experienced officers and NCOs still inside the, the core of that brigade, uh, in two months, uh, I think I would be ready to go. I'd feel confident that we would have, um, in terms of physical uh, readiness uh, of the people um, and uh, being able to conduct our, our mission essential tasks, you know, attack, defend, uh, breaching uh, obstacles, uh, coordinating uh, indirect fire, uh, operating in a very, very uh, tough electronic warfare environment. I mean, that would be a priority is, is training on uh, assuming that the Russians had uh, electronic warfare dominance. Uh, I would want to practice operating in that environment uh, nonstop. I think two months, you could be ready. Now, if you're starting with a brand new brigade with with very few experienced officers and NCOs. Obviously, that probably adds a little bit more time. Now, by this point, it was very clear that generating new combat-capable units was important, not just generating new trained personnel. Outside the interview, I asked Ben Hodges about some of the different models for how to regenerate a force during a war, comparing, for example, the approach taken by the Russians with some of their mobilised personnel in 2022, where troops were sent forward as replacements to existing units in order to bulk out the front line without always taking the step of withdrawing those units from combat first, as compared to alternative approaches practiced by both sides of generating entirely new brigades or creating new battalions and formations within the framework of existing brigades. In that context, he said that he would generally prefer to replace units rather than individuals, that cohesion was key to combat power, and that, quote, the combat power that comes from a cohesive unit with experienced leaders, even after suffering casualties over a period of time, is likely to be greater than one with an infusion of new troops while they are in combat, end quote. Instead, he stressed the importance of pulling units off the line to then take on replacements and rebuild and reconstitute themselves. In a similar vein, and getting back to the interview, General Hodges had a couple of additional comments to make on how exactly one might efficiently and effectively go about regenerating a brigade on a compressed timescale. So 
Uh, let me you thank you, uh, John. You've you've made me think of a, another thing. I want to make sure I include as you're trying to describe and as your listeners are wanting to understand or maybe criticize my my assessment. Um, when we talk about training a brigade over two months, uh, a lot of what's happening is what we call multi echelon training. I mean, the brigade staff needs the troops to to create the friction and the demand on logistics, et cetera, but most of the time when when the training is focused on the brigade staff, the troops end up sitting around a lot. And so uh, what we do uh, in the U.S. Army, for example, and I think others, multi-echelon training. So while the brigade staff is doing certain things down in the companies and the platoons, they may be doing something totally different, you know, focused on uh, whether it's gunnery or uh, battle drills for entering and clearing a trench or bunkers or, or, uh, et cetera, uh, until they're needed for large-scale maneuver. So that so it's a pretty sophisticated approach in that two months where you're doing, where everybody is working out all your different muscle groups until it's time to come together for a large-scale collective event, and then they go back out. So that's, that's kind of the process. Just like if you think about a, a professional uh, football squad, whether it's European football or American football, people are off in different corners of the pitch doing their thing, and then they come together for the collective event, and then they go back out. So that's what's happening during that two months. Now, employing a little bit of time travel here, the day after the interview was over, I had a chance to ask a couple of follow-up questions. The first was around training abbreviation, just how short could you cut some of these training programs? Because in the military context, there's obviously a sliding scale between the F-35 pilot training program and the true enemy at the gates experience. In the case of Ukraine, we've seen a lot of training program abbreviation with some infantry courses reportedly being cut down to as short as five weeks. And so I asked Ben Hodges what the factors a commander might be weighing when balancing the need to compress training to pull all troops through a pipeline quickly, as opposed to extending training in order to impart more skills. I'll put the full text of the response on screen, but the essence was that there is a lot you can probably safely cut, and that compression might just mean transitioning away from a normal peacetime training program to one that's executed with more urgency, less downtime, less admin-related activities, and a prioritization of what is truly necessary as opposed to good to have. He stressed that Ukrainians had consistently been able to adopt new technologies relatively quickly, but at the same time it was important not to cut out too many practical aspects of training. He talked about the need to balance the risk of increased casualties or mission failures against the need to achieve mass sooner but ultimately stress that training for a soldier doesn't end when they arrive at their unit or in theatre. And I'll add here the personal observation, albeit based on anecdotal reports, that a lot of Ukrainian and Russian troops ultimately end up learning most of their skills once they're already at the front, albeit with the caveat that the experience and lessons learned there often come at a significant cost. So that might be a good pivot then to, to get your impression of some of the fighting that we've seen over 2023, particularly that offensive. So earlier this year, you were making the statement that if the Ukrainians got everything they asked for, then by the end of this year, we'd likely be a Crimea. Obviously, they did not then get everything they asked for. Um, I totaled it up. I think in the end, the, the pledges of tanks were a bit over a third of what they asked for when you account for Leo II, Abrams, and Challenger. A lot of that didn't arrive in time. And then some systems uh, didn't arrive either at all until well after the initial phase was over. I'm thinking here, for example, of those, uh, those M39 Block 1 ATACMs that did a fantastic job on those two Russian helicopter bases but only several months after those helicopters had been very active in dealing with the right. counteroffensive. So my question is, what is your assessment, insofar as you can provide it from afar, of the combat performance of the Ukrainians relative to the material they actually ended up receiving? I think it's incredible um, if the numbers that were released just the other day about Russian casualties, and that after nine years of combat, the Russia still only controls... 19 or 18 percent of Ukraine, uh, that they've lost half of what they took since uh, February last year, that the Russian Air Force has not yet destroyed a single train or convoy bringing equipment and ammunition from Poland into Ukraine, not one, uh, that the Russian Navy has had to withdraw about a third of its fleet from Sevastopol after the Ukrainians used just three Storm Shadow cruise missiles to hit Sevastopol. And Ukraine didn't even have a navy. So, you know, there's uh, so much focus, I think, which is unwarranted on, okay, we didn't get through the minefields as quickly as we wanted, and we didn't make the progress that we wanted. But yet, at this point in the war, less than two years after the start of the large-scale operation, with Russia having every advantage 
look where we are. And that's without us providing the things that Ukraine needed. So um, I, I I don't get the hand wringing about, you know, it's inevitable. Ukraine has to, they should go negotiate. There's no way they can win. I think, you know, the Russians see that they have no hope. There's no hope for them to win, only for us to quit. And, and so that's why they are doing what they're doing, pushing thousands of uh, of uh, untrained uh troops into the meat grinder and they're willing to sacrifice hundreds every day um, and, and the thousands of vehicles they've lost because they want to convey the impression that they have endless resources and that Russian victory is inevitable. So that's that's the approach they're taking. And um, so we've got to help, number one, counter that narrative by demonstrating that we are in fact committed to Ukraine, but then giving them what they need. And I listened to General Cavoli the, uh, at a conference a little while back, and um, he said precision can defeat mass. And mass, of course, is the only advantage, the, the, the real advantage that the Russians still have. Precision can defeat mass if you have enough time. And what he's talking about, if you can, with long-range precision strike capability, you take out Russian headquarters, artillery, and logistics, then it doesn't matter how many troops you have. The, you, your mass is uh, neutralized or, or negated when they don't have artillery or logistics or headquarters to direct. And so the, the biggest shortfall of, of what uh, we have not provided Ukrainians are long-range precision strike capability. And I'm talking specifically ATACOMS, uh, more Storm Shadow, the French Scout, the German Taurus, or the uh, ground launch small diameter bombs, uh, Gray Eagle drones, all of these things that would enable Ukraine to knock out uh, headquarters, artillery, and logistics, and most importantly, make Crimea untenable for Russian forces. The Ukrainians have proven the concept with those three storm shadows when they destroyed the Russian Black Sea Fleet headquarters and severely damaged the dry dock there in Sevastopol, that forced the commander to withdraw a third of his ships out of Sevastopol. And that's after just three storm shadow. Imagine uh, if they had 50, 60, or 200 ATACOMs and Taurus, what they could be doing. Cutting in again here is Future Perun, the talk about the importance of long-range precision fires and other resources touched on an area that I thought was worth focusing on. And that's the importance of Ukraine and Ukraine's allies efficiently allocating the resources available to it in 2024 in order to ensure the best results. For me, one indication of the potential risks here was the recent reporting that Ukraine had included the Terminal High Altitude Air Defense System in its latest list of requests for US weapon systems. That is a very capable anti-ballistic missile defense system that would admittedly probably be capable of defending a place like Kyiv against some of the threat posed by Russian and potentially Iranian ballistic missiles. The problem is, it's also one of the most complicated, most expensive pieces of equipment operated by the US Army. Back in 2012, the authorization for a foreign military sale of THAAD missiles to the United Arab Emirates priced a package that included nine launchers, 48 missiles, and associated training parts and logistical support at a cool 1.135 billion 2012 US dollars. And if there's only a limited sum available for support of Ukraine in the United States, Europe, or other allied states, then if you start including premium options like FAD in the support packages, then you might start pricing out other vitally needed systems and munitions. Establishing a FAD system around Kyiv, for example, might come at a cost that would have paid for hundreds or even thousands of cruise missiles. And when a system is so expensive that it makes even something relatively blingy like AGM-158 or Storm Shadow look pretty basic, it might be that a lot of thought is necessary before funds are ultimately committed. So I decided to put the question of priorities and resources in 2024 and 2025 to Ben Hodges, but for him, as you'll hear, the focus wasn't so much on individual systems, but instead on some of the actions he believes the Ukrainian military and allied governments may choose to take. So the question then is 2025, uh, 2024 and 2025 looking forward, because the Russian strategy as they put forward, and obviously I'm interpreting here from, for example, the speech that Shoigu gave saying, we need to be ready to keep fighting until 2025, perhaps observing that there's been some weakness in the resolution of some nations in the West to get additional support to Ukraine, and the fact that that support may be limited in terms of the sum of money that is available and voted. If you want to build Ukrainian capability to fight that longer war, so through 2024, potentially into 2025, 
and you only have so many resources to do it, what are the priority areas that you, where do you allocate those scarce resources in 2024 to get the best bang for your buck? Yeah. Okay, look, uh, the Ukrainians absolutely do not have unlimited resources, uh, especially artillery and, and long-range precision weapons. I think this is pretty well known, but it is not too late. Um, I believe that Russia lacks a decisive uh, they don't have the ability to break through Ukrainian lines and you know and and keep moving towards Kharkiv or Kiev. They they don't have that. It doesn't exist. Uh, and the Russian logistics system is uh, very fragile. Um, I mean, it's extremely fragile. It was never designed to support uh, long term operations, land operations outside of Russia. And and so it's a vulnerability. I think that Ukraine should be should be and will exploit both through long-range fires, uh, drones, uh, and as well as uh, sabotage. Um, having said all that, this is what I think Ukraine will be doing and should be doing over the next few months as they prepare to regain initiative. Uh, number one, we've already talked about reconstituting units which have been worn down for months of fighting. You know, when you think about what the 101st, if you go back uh, in history, the 101st fought for like, I mean, it was like 70 something consecutive days. I'm going to get my math wrong here, but basically when they jumped in on June the 5th, 1944, they were in nonstop combat um, all the way up through the end of September. So June, July, August, September, it's like 120 days uh, through Market Garden. And then they were taken out of the line to reconstitute. They had suffered a lot of casualties, equipment was worn out. Boots were worn out, and they were back in a reconstitution facility in France when the Battle of the Bulge started. So, I mean, this was this was a common practice in the war, and I think Ukrainians um, will do this. Uh, number two, they are going to have to improve uh, their recruiting system in order to maximize available manpower. Right now, they they've got too many military age males and women uh, walking around in Ukraine that should be in the military. And you've got thousands of Ukrainians, uh, military age males that are here in Germany and Poland and Romania. Uh, Ukraine has got to fix their recruiting system and get these uh, fit, able-bodied men and women uh, into uniform. Uh, they're going to have to increase production of ammunition and weapons in Ukraine. Some of these things are already happening, uh, but it is possible when you're at war to increase production, even with Russian missiles raining down on your cities. I mean, Think about what Germany did in, in 1944. The aircraft production for the Luftwaffe peaked in 1944. Uh, that's after more than two years of uh, steady bombing by the Royal Air Force and the U.S. Uh, uh, Army Air Corps, uh, bombing the hell out of German cities, but yet German aircraft production increased. So I think Ukraine can do that with some uh, improving efficiency. Some Western companies are already there helping. Um I think Ukraine is going to be, uh, they're working to be ready to employ F-16s probably in the summer. Um, you know, it's one thing to train pilots to fly, and, and Ukraine will have no problem finding pilots who can fly. But uh, being able to operate in a very, very dense air defense environment, uh, conducting combat operations, that's a, that's a different matter. So they will, I think they will be smart about how they finally do employ F-16s this summer. They're going to have to continue to improve air and missile defense uh, and, and build it and make sure that their power generation infrastructure is resilient. Um, it, it's going to be under siege every day for the next three or four months, as, it's, as we're already watching right now. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, the requirement for them to get better at operating in a very, very difficult, challenging, contested uh, electronic warfare environment. Uh, I anticipate that they will continue sabotage efforts against Russian energy infrastructure and logistics inside Russia, as well as in Russian occupied parts of uh, of, of Ukraine. Um, I think they will continue to put pressure on uh, Russian forces in Crimea, uh, both Navy as well as Air Force, and particularly the large logistics hub at Zhankoy in the northern part of, of Crimea, which supplies Russian forces in the south. And then finally, um, keep maintaining pressure uh, on the Russian logistics system. I, I think uh, Russia's dependence on North Korea for artillery ammunition is a giveaway uh, 
of how desperate they are. And my Ukrainian friend tells me that the quality of the North Korean artillery ammunition is really poor. It's unsafe. So uh, there's exploitation opportunities for the Ukrainians against Russian logistics. I, I would hate to be a Russian private sitting in a trench this winter, knowing that my leadership not only doesn't care about me, they're not going to fight to deliver what I need, and, and I'm going to get used as cannon fodder. I think this is opportunity for Ukraine. And then to close out, let me then ask if those are some of the opportunities and areas of focus. Again, if there are limited resources, say, for example, the U.S. only votes a $60 billion package to cover the year, what are some of the potential pitfalls that you would suggest might need to be avoided? What are some of the traps that might suck up resources without getting a great return on investment? Um, the all bling, no basics. Yeah, um, that's that's good. I, I think um, Ukrainians will, uh, they will have learned from the, what they did this summer and, and they uh, will be thinking about how do they regain the initiative? I don't think we'll see a, a resumption of the same type uh, of attack, um, but I think that they will uh, have figured out where where those weaknesses are, and um, and they'll be watching closely to see how does Russia try to rebuild or strengthen its its defenses um, in the interim. I don't I don't think there's a winter pause per se, but I, I think that there is. Um, you know, the idea, because the Russians are trying large scale attacks right now and they're just, you know, they're they're getting crushed. Um, so the Ukrainians probably right now are happy to uh, um, let the Russians bleed out uh, for a while while they try to do these other things that I've talked about. Um, but at the end of the day, they, they I don't think that they can take a year uh, just kind of, hey, let's, let's work on digging our trenches a little bit deeper and, and, and allow the current um, sort of situation to harden and, and become the new facts on the ground. I, I, after listening to President Zelensky the other day during his visit to Washington, um, you know, when he talks about how, how can you give up ground? Those are Ukrainian people that live there. This is not dirt. This These are people, lives. And so I don't think the Ukrainians are going to just sit back. I I don't think the big Kerch Bridge will survive 2024. I think the Ukrainians are going to figure out a way to finally, you know, permanently disable that thing. It'll be a combination of uh, ways, but but I think we're going to see Kerch Bridge drop in 2024. On that particular note, the interview closed out and it falls to me to provide a conclusion. The observations I think I can make here are this. NATO militaries never abandoned the idea of large-scale combat operations, far from it. But the fighting in Ukraine has highlighted the potential importance of both old and new technologies and skills that may not have been areas of priority focus through much of the post-Cold War era. The challenge now for NATO and other allied militaries is probably twofold. How do they learn and adapt lessons from the fighting in Ukraine for themselves, while providing training support to Ukraine that answers the need for quantity, quality, and relevance to the fighting? And in practice, what that probably means is that even as NATO and allied military trainers work with Ukrainian personnel to train them, they're also trying to learn from and develop the cadre of Ukrainian officers and veterans who are likely to be absolutely essential to the training effort in 2024. In 2022 and 23, I'd argue Ukraine has proven capable of outperforming its material resources, and training may well be a key driver in determining whether or not they're capable of continuing to do so in 2024. I'll also note that General Hodges makes a range of interesting predictions for the Ukrainians in 2024, including new attempts to seize the initiative back from the Russian Federation and attacks on the Kerch Strait Bridge and other Russian logistical links. My observation there is that Ukraine's options are probably going to be very tightly tied to material availability, and so the path the fighting takes in 2024 may be correlated not just with decisions taken in Kyiv, but decisions on aid made in Brussels and Washington, D.C. Okay, and now it's a channel update to close out, which always feels very strange at the end of an interview-based episode, but here we are. Firstly, I need to extend my thanks to Ben Hodges for agreeing to this interview. The last time he appeared on the channel was in October 2022, a very different stage in this war, and so I appreciate him returning to once again talk about topics like training and force generation. For sake of transparency, I'll stress that Ben has been adamant that he won't take a speaking fee for appearing on the channel but that after the interview concluded, I did extend an offer to make a donation to a charity or non-profit of his choice. Next week, as we get closer to Christmas, I will be moving away from Ukraine as a topic for a week or two. But as always, if there are ever any sudden or dramatic developments, that plan might change. 
Until then, please allow me, as always, to extend my genuine thanks to all of you who follow and support the channel. And with any luck, as always, I'll see you all again next week.